Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. At the core of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five lie two entities, Melly Mel and his brother Kid Creole, and Grandmaster Flash and Keith Cowboy. Melly Mel and Creole were indirectly influenced to become writers by their sister Linda, who wrote poetry. Around 1976 or so, they began to mimic Cool Herc affiliates Timmy Tim, Coca LaRock, and Clark Kent. According to Melly Mel, at this point there was no distinction between the DJ and the MC because all DJs were MCs in the beginning. Mel says further that Timmy Tim and Clark Kent were saying rhymes on the microphone, but they weren't on beat and they were more like nursery rhymes and little phrases and not complete rhymes. But those embryonic phrases would become the building blocks upon which Melly Mel and Creole will create a new style that would influence tens of thousands of MCs if not more and establish the new cadence of the MC. It's of utmost importance to note that when I talk to the practitioners of this art form that we call MCing, they all point to one or two entities as being the first that they witnessed to do this. It's always either DJ Hollywood or Melly Mel, Creole, or Keith Cowboy. Kid Creole told me that the first person that he ever heard say a full rhyme about themselves that wasn't a nursery rhyme and that was on beat was his brother Melly Mel. Now this certainly is not to discredit or belittle the contributions of those MC slash DJs that I mentioned previously that may have had a more embryonic and so-called nursery style of rhyme. But that braggadocia that Kid Creole describes that he witnessed from his brother Melly Mel is the building block upon which the modern day MC is built. Mel and Creole would travel to wherever DJs had equipment and they both say that Herc was the first DJ with a legitimate setup of equipment that was playing this new breakbeat style of music. The two brothers would hone their craft and they got it to the point where they could finish each other's sentences and split up words and phrases between each other. Because they wrote together, that was a natural progression, but this was a style that would give birth to many MCs that came after them. Grandmaster Flash was a DJ, an electronics major, and a ghetto scientist. He was influenced by DJ Cool Herc, who had noticed that when the breakdown part of a funk, soul, or R&B record came on at his parties, the energy of the crowd went to a high level. So he found a way to isolate that breakdown or what Pete DJ Jones calls the get down part of a record between two turntables to keep the party energy high for a longer amount of time. Now Grandmaster Flash tells me that Herc was isolating these breaks, but he was doing it in a very sloppy fashion. The crowd would be in disarray. They may be getting down to the get down part of the record one minute, but when Herc would bring the next record in, it wasn't on beat. He didn't really take great care with his timing and his transitions from one record to another. So Flash really admired what he saw from Herc, but he wanted to do it better. He wanted to take these breaks and run them behind each other, but do it on time so there's a cohesion on the dance floor. Grandmaster Flash befriended Gene Livingston, or DJ Mean Gene, who was another Bronx DJ. They developed a partnership, and at the time, Gene had more equipment than Flash did. So Flash took his equipment to the Livingston family home, and that's where he practiced. Flash describes Gene as the neighborhood bully, and you really didn't want to piss Gene off. So Gene's mother's apartment was one of those big old school apartments, and Gene's room was all the way in the back. So when Flash had to walk back to Gene's room, he would notice in the living room, Gene's little brother Theodore executing this technique on his mother's stereo, where he would drop the needle right on the get down part of the record. He had the uncanny ability to be able to eye the break based on the thin part of the groove of the record. Flash told Gene, look, that's what I'm trying to do. Not in that manner, but I'm trying to isolate the break on beat. Can I take your little brother with me out to the park and we display this for the public? Again, Gene was the neighborhood bully and he warned Flash, no, stay away from my little brother. Flash promised, but he didn't make good on his promise. Whenever Gene wasn't around, he would practice with Theodore. He would eventually take a milk crate, take Theodore to 63 Park, and debut the needle drop for the crowd. Of course, upon finding out, Gene was furious and Flash was out. He was on his own at this point. Now within this timeline of events, 
Grandmaster Flash was friends with one of the so-called disco DJs, Pete DJ Jones, who played for the downtown crowd. Pete Jones didn't play at the parks. He played at the adult nightclubs where you had to actually pay a cover fee to get in and have on hard bottom shoes and a collar shirt. But what he did have that greatly interested Flash was a cueing system on his mixer. This allowed him to hear what he was going to play before debuting it and making it public to the crowd. This is what Flash felt that Hurt lacked, the ability to hear the record before you display it to the public. So Flash, seeing Pete DJ Jones' Clubman mixer with this cueing system on it, went to the junkyard, got a single pole double throw switch, glued it to the top of his mixer, and made his own makeshift cueing system. This way he could hear the record before he made it public. He also developed a clock technique or clock theory amongst other DJ theories where he could mark a record and know where that mark was going to hit in a certain time on each turntable. With this clock theory, he could keep that beat seamlessly looped and improve greatly upon what Cool Herc had done. But there was one problem. The DJs like Cool Herc and other early DJs who were really the first MCs would talk over top of the records. Just little phrases. Yes, yes, y'all, to the beat, y'all. You listen to the sounds of Cool Herc and the Herculoids. Things of that nature. But Flash absolutely hated his speaking voice and he didn't like the way he sounded. So Flash told me that he made a mic available at all of his parties, just open on a table for anybody who wanted to come up and attempt to MC. According to Flash, all failed but one, and that was Keith Cowboy. Flash says that vocally, Cowboy had like a ringmaster announcer's voice, the perfect voice to be an MC, and that he employed these call and response techniques that totally sucked the crowd in. Before Keith Cowboy met up with Flash, and grabbed the mic to help MC, Flash would have no MC at all, and when he took his DJ invention to the parks, he said it was like a seminar. Nobody danced. They just stood around and stared at what he did because they had never seen it done quite that way. But now that he had an MC in Keith Cowboy, the park was no longer a seminar. Cowboy would say things like, throw your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care. Everybody say ho. If you love your mama, say ho. All the ladies in the house say ow. Of course, all of these phrases sound familiar because they're staples for the live performance of the MC. Even in 2016, every MC uses that call and response as a segue between rhymes or just a way to get the crowd hyped up. Physically, Cowboy was very bow-legged and he walked like the Cowboys in the old westerns. That's where he got the nickname Cowboy. He was said to be very nice with his hands as far as defending himself. And Grandmaster Melly Mel tells me that that's how the whole group got into fitness and lifting weights was through Keith Cowboy early on. So those are two seeds of the group that would eventually become one of the most influential and successful early hip hop groups. Melly Mel and his brother Creole on one side advancing greatly upon styles that were already in existence from early DJs. And on the other side, DJ Grandmaster Flash and Keith Cowboy filling in the other side of the equation. Like many of the early MCs, Melly Mel was originally a b-boy. The b-boys were later christened breakdancers, but he was a b-boy and part of a group called the D-Squad and he used to dance for Grandmaster Flash originally. So since Mel and Creole were already hanging out at Flash parties and dancing for Flash, Flash already had his microphone available for MCs and Cowboy was an MC for Flash. Flash had mastered his clock theory and getting his break beats on time. It's only a natural progression that Mel and his brother Creole will pick up the mic device as well, along with Cowboy at those parties. At this point, a group was formed, and they called themselves Grandmaster Flash and the three MCs. Mr. Ness, who would later become Scorpio, was also a b-boy who danced with Mel, and he and Mel were very good friends. In fact, Scorpio says the first time that he had met Flash was when he came to his junior high school. Scorpio and Mel went to the same high school and actually Grandmaster Flash came with Mean Gene to have a b-boy battle against Mel and Scorpio. But all of these guys were from the same neighborhood and Scorpio was always hanging around with the group and at one point he approached Mel and asked could he be down. In fact, Scorp says that Flash didn't have a home base and the park where he started to play and develop his home base was 23 Park and that's where they lived. Mel and Creole on one block, Cowboy up the block, 
and Scorpio on another block. Scorp says that once Mel and Creo started rhyming, he wasn't rhyming yet, but he was always right there hanging around. Once Scorpio started writing rhymes, he approached Mel to be down with the group. And then you had the birth of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Four. Raheem was a Bronx MC who also had a talent for singing and harmonizing. The first MCs that he ever witnessed were actually the three MCs, Melly Mel, Kid Creole, and Cowboy. His influence to become an MC is somebody who is not even known in hip hop, and his name was MC Jazzy Joe. MC Jazzy Joe went to the same high school as Raheem did, which was Truman High School. He would walk around the high school saying rhymes and had a nice little reputation with the young ladies requesting him to rhyme. That was Raheem's actual direct inspiration to start writing rhymes. He started writing his rhymes and challenged Joe to a battle one day and took him out in the battle. Ross says that this got him a pretty good reputation at the school and he started rhyming about 1977. But the roots of Raheem's talent weren't even rhyming, they were singing as I previously mentioned. In fact, he had a group with Christopher Williams, who would later become an R&B giant in the 90s, and they would sing in the hallways of Truman High School on a daily basis and had a very large following. An interesting side note is that Raheem says it was he who actually told Christopher Williams that he needed to develop his own style. Christopher Williams was singing the same style as Raheem, and Raheem told him if you're gonna imitate somebody, why don't you imitate somebody who was already popular, and as soon as their fame dies down, you can step in and resurrect that style. Christopher Williams took his advice, and the singer that he chose to emulate was Teddy Pendergrass. One of the first MC groups that Raheem was a part of was a group called the Master Plan 2 in Phase 1. It consisted of himself, Aaron Johnson, who was down with DST and would later be Chris and Shaheem, Devon, CJ, and Chris. They did mostly house parties, and this was where Raheem further honed his MCing abilities. Raheem's first MC name was Crazy T, and the T stood for Todd, which is his middle name. Todd's mentor as far as singing was Raheem LeBlanc from the group GQ. Ross says he would just stare at Raheem from GQ whenever he would perform and just try to get as much technique as he could from him. Raheem became his student and actually changed his name to Raheem based on that influence from Raheem from GQ. So Shaheem, who was a part of the Master Plan 2 in Phase 1 with Raheem, and was also a member of Grand Mixer DST's Infinity Rappers, lived on the same block as DJ Baron of the Brothers Disco and the Funky Four. He told Raheem that DJ Baron was holding auditions for the Funky Four and he should come try out. Raheem said his audition actually ended up being a battle between Breakout and Baron and a group called the Little Brothers from Co-op City. During this battle, Baron handed the microphone to Raheem, Raheem rhymed, and he was in with the Funky Four. Sometime in the second half of 1979, there was a battle between the Funky Four, of which Raheem was a member, and the Furious Four, which now consisted of Melly Mel, Creo, Cowboy, and Scorpio. Raheem, with his unique style of rhyming and harmonizing, was the secret weapon for the Funky Four. There's a longer version of the story of exactly what happened during this battle at thefoundation.com. But for the sake of brevity here, what I'll say is after the battle, Grandmaster Flash the Furious Four approached Raheem with an offer to join them. Raheem joined, and that was the birth of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five became a force to reckon with. Their home base became the Black Door, and they had security from the Casanova Street Gang. Ray Chandler, the owner of the Black Door, became their manager. Grandmaster Flash had two assistants, Easy Mike and Disco B, who were able to DJ for the group in the event of his absence, assist him with his records, and fill in wherever needed. Easy Mike was Flash's childhood friend, who could do many of the things on the wheels that Flash could. I call Easy Mike the seventh man, because he was always in promotional shots with the group, videos, even on the album cover for The Message and some of their greatest hits albums. Many flyers from the early days of hip hop, even before rap records were made, will bear the names of Easy Mike and Disco B, along with Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. The synergy of this group was incredible. Everybody had a position to play, and there were so many firsts within this group, and so many unique characteristics that came together as one to form this super group. DJ Grandmaster Flash had taken Herc's theory and perfected it. 
He had developed his own theories also, like phasing, the previously mentioned clock theory, backspinning, and many more. And because Flash was an electronics genius, who was always toying around with things that he was pulling in from junkyards, they had an advantage that just made them unstoppable as a group. One of the many weapons in their arsenal, which also became one of Creo's weapons and signatures, was the echo chamber. The echo chamber provided constant echo for whoever would approach the mic device and talk through it. The only problem was it was always on. Flash, being the genius that he was, took a light switch and wired it into the echo chamber so that he could turn it off and on at his own will. This way he could put emphasis on certain words and make them echo. Creo was the one in the group who really felt that and really embraced the echo chamber and saw that it could be an advantage. There was also the infamous beatbox. The beatbox was an electronic drum machine that one of Flash's neighbors owned who was a drummer. He used to use it to keep his fingers nimble when he couldn't get access to his drum set. Flash begged him to sell it to him. It had a bass key, a hi-hat key, a snare, and hand claps. It was made by the Vox company, VOX, out of the UK. He sold it to Flash for $125 and Flash christened it the Beatbox. Flash would incorporate this into their live set, along with his spinning of break beats, scratching, back spinning, and everything else that he was doing. Melly Mel was the clever lyricist in the group who really had an emphasis on wordplay, metaphors, and poetic things of that nature. He also wrote a lot of the routines. In fact, one of their popular and early routines was actually done over top of that beatbox that Flash was using, and it was called Flash to the Beat. That routine was written by Raheem and Mel as they walked through Katrona Park one night in the Bronx. Mel was definitely a visionary and prophet within the group. If you listen to some of their early records, specifically Super Rappin' and We Rap More Mellow, you can hear within his rhymes the things that Mel was saying that he would do one day. Now honestly, all MCs bragged and boasted back then, and they probably didn't really believe what they were saying, but the things that Mel was saying on the mic would all come to fruition so Mel was definitely an early prophet on the microphone. Cool Mo D of the Treacherous Three described Kid Creole as one of the early hype men in hip hop. With that announcer's voice that he had and his command of the echo chamber, he was an entity within his own self. Mr. Ness, later Scorpio, was a visual cat in the group. The way he dressed, the poses that he did on stage, he was definitely the cat with what you would call now swagger at that time in the group. Raheem was the other lyricist in the group, who also had that special secret weapon of his harmonizing and singing. Raheem had a different swing or cadence to his rhymes, but he was definitely a lyrical cat in the group, but because Melly Mel dominated so much lyrically within the group, a lot of people never saw Raheem's true lyrical abilities. Keith Cowboy was the master of call and response. He was the one saying, yes y'all, throw your hands in the air, wave them like you just don't care, all the ladies say ah, all the fellas say ho. He had a way of personalizing the crowd and making the crowd feel that he was talking directly to them. He was known less for his written rhymes, but more for his ability to motivate the crowd. Scorpio tells me he would even address the crowd and ask them if they saw the Knicks game last night, and just things that no other MC was doing at the time, with the exception of maybe Busy B to a degree. Cowboy was also the enforcer in the group, and the one that kept a lot of the street elements that were in the Bronx off the Furious Five's back. Most importantly, Cowboy is credited with coining the phrase hip-hop, which actually became the name of the street culture that includes breakdancing or b-boying, emceeing, DJing, and graffiti art. But at this time, it was just Cowboy on the microphone goofing around when one of their friends, Billy, was going off to the army. At a live party that they were throwing for Billy, Cowboy got on the mic and just was teasing Billy at that point, telling him he was going to be marching in the army. Hip hop, hip hop, left, right, hip hop. And it caught on. And he started incorporating this into his rhymes, which you saw a lot of MCs do later. The hip hop, hip hop, you don't stop. That is all said to be born with Keith Cowboy. So when you have one group with this much specialized talent all in one unit, it's really hard to get any competition that could really, really give them a run for their money. The group says that throughout the late 70s, there were always people hanging around at their parties, different promoters and whatnot, approaching them about making records. At this time, it hadn't been done yet. The first rap records didn't come out to the end of 1979. 
but they would always turn down these people who approached them because they felt like, who would want to hear this? We're talking, and we're talking over somebody else's music. You can't put that on a record. It can't be done yet. The vision just wasn't there as of yet. But the records were right around the corner, and the unofficial bootleg recordings were already here. The infamous Flash to the Beat bootleg recording from Bronx River Center. This is the previously mentioned routine written by Melly Mel and Raheem as they walked around Katona Park. It features the harmonizing, flash playing the beatbox, and the emceeing skills that would set the world on fire in just a few short years. It's interesting to note that on this version of the song, it's Melly Mel that's singing and not Raheem. They had just done two shows the night previous, and Raheem had lost his voice. So it's actually Melly Mel singing the whole song as far as all the singing and harmonizing parts. Raheem is on the recording, but he's chanting and filling in certain words and not singing. It's actually Melly Mel. Many elements of this bootleg recording will serve as the basis and core of their next couple of official recordings. In talking to various members of the group and other groups that were affiliated with them, there were many times when Flash and the group were separated. On many older live recordings, you would hear Charlie Chase, the DJ for the Cold Crush Brothers, filling in for Grandmaster Flash. Or you might hear a tape with Grandmaster Flash DJing for Curtis Blow or Cool Cow the Star Child instead of the Furious Five. When I questioned the members about the source of their separations, they said it was always due to money and the fact that Flash got paid aside from them. They said that Flash would set up a deal with the promoters where he got paid a certain amount and they got paid separately and they were never privy to how much he got paid. This caused dissension within the group from the beginning, even before records came along. So there were early separations in the beginning of the group. During one of these separations, a producer named Terry Lewis approached the group about making a record. They went in the studio with the band and Mr. Lewis and did some recording, but they never discussed any contracts or the release of any material. In 1979, We Rap More Mellow was released under the name The Younger Generation on Brass Records. This same label and Terry Lewis had released a record by Busy B, DJ AJ, and DJ Smalls called Rapping All Over, and it was also credited to the younger generation. So this was apparently a generic name that this producer was using when he put out different rap groups. Even though the backing band on We Rap More Mellow was not as good as the Sugar Hill Band or the band who was actually the backing band for Enjoy Records, there still were some standout parts of this particular record. Just for some context as far as the timeline, the Sugar Hill Gang had already released Rappers Delight on Sugar Hill Records a few months before. But any records that came out in 1979 were among the first handful of recorded rap records. When we rap more mellow, we got a chance to see early glimpses of the genius of the group. First of all, their ability to make a cohesive unit out of five guys on the microphone. On one of the lines where they say we're gonna make five MCs sound like one, they truly did it with this particular record. We got a chance to see some foundations of some routines on this particular record. As previously mentioned, there were several independent record label owners who hung around the hip hop clubs trying to get crews to sign record deals. Grandmaster Flash says that an older gentleman started hanging around their jams and that he thought he was either a detective or a father looking for his daughter. Either way, Flash didn't think it was good news. 
but it was actually independent record label owner Bobby Robinson of Enjoy Records. Now I've heard conflicting reports from group members. Some group members say that Spoonie G, who was actually Bobby Robinson's nephew by marriage, told Bobby about Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. But I've also heard from Grandmaster Flash that one night when he was breaking down equipment after a jam, Bobby Robinson approached him about recording for Enjoy. Scorpio tells me that after they sold out the Autobahn Ballroom, Bobby Robinson was impressed by that and offered them a contract. But either way, Bobby Robinson, who had had success with Gladys Knight and the Pips and several doo-wop and soul groups decades before, was looking to capitalize off of this new rap trend that was dominating the streets of New York. So Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five ended up signing with Bobby Robinson, and within a week of them signing, they were in the studio laying down super rapping. Super Rappin' was lyrically identical to their unauthorized release of We Rap More Mellow under the name Younger Generation. Lyrically, the only difference was that they added parts from their Flash to the Beat routine. Musically, this track was far superior to We Rap More Mellow. It was actually a replay of the seven minutes of funk break by the Hold On family. Super Rappin' clocked in at around 12 minutes. In the next year, in 1980, Bobby Robinson released Super Rappin' 2. Super Rappin' 2 was a shorter version of Super Rappin' with identical music. It was really just an edited down version and an attempt by Bobby Robinson to continue to capitalize off the success of Super Rap. By 1980, Sylvia Robinson of New Jersey-based Sugar Hill Records, no relation to Bobby Robinson, was buying up the contracts of all the hot rap acts so she could have all the acts under one roof at Sugar Hill Records. Bobby Robinson had a reputation for signing the most authentic rap acts at the time, Funky 4 Plus 1 and Grandmaster Flash being amongst them. So she bought their contract from Bobby Robinson and their first release on Sugar Hill Records in 1980 was Freedom. Freedom was probably the most perfect early rap record in existence. The musical track was based on a song called Get Up and Dance by the group Freedom. This track was originally offered to Lovebug Starsky as he was supposed to sign to Sugar Hill Records, but never did. In fact, he actually recorded vocals to the song, but the song was never released. The Sugar Hill House Band, containing Doug Wimbish, Keith LeBlanc, Skip Alexander, and Ed Fletcher, replayed Get Up and Dance almost as good, if not better, than the original. This track is a smoker from intro to outro. From the second that Melly Mel comes in with his intro, the energy in the song is high level all the way to the end when Cowboy closes it out. The MCs take their technique of making a cohesive unit out of five MCs to the next level on this track. Everything about this record makes it a perfect early 80s party track, especially the horn section supplied by the Chops horns. For many outside of the tri-state area, this would be the track that would provide the template for how it should be done. But this track was also the birth of some dissension in the group, particularly with Grandmaster Flash and his position on the recordings. Most crews on Sugar Hill Records had their own DJs, but when it was time to tour, they were not allowed to tour with the groups. The Sugar Hill Band provided the backing on the live tours. The only group who was allowed to take their DJ was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Many pioneering rap acts cite this as the genesis of the separation between the DJ and the MC and the DJ taking the back seat. Some go as far as saying that that was the death of hip hop, the first day that a rap record contract was signed. Either way, at this point DJs were not scratching, cutting, or mixing on records and Grandmaster Flash was very upset that he had no role as far as this record went, studio-wise. Musically, most of the records that Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five made were based off of already existing beats that were hot in the streets, and these were beats that Flash came up with. 
So in essence, he was already a co-producer because the musical tracks were ideas that he had already put together. But because of copyright issues and the fact that the technology did not exist yet to actually sample or loop a record, house bands had to replay popular breakbeats. This left the DJs out in the cold in most cases. But as previously mentioned, Flash was able to tour with the Furious Five, and that's probably because what he did was such an essential part of their live show that their show just wouldn't be what it was supposed to be with the band backing them. In 1981, the group kept the momentum of freedom going with a song that was the idea of Melly Mel called The Birthday Party. Lyrically, The Birthday Party was based on the zodiac signs and birth dates of the members of the group. And the song allowed for heavy crowd participation, shouting out their birthdays and zodiac signs. Kid Creo tells me that they had the opportunity to record several commercials for radio stations and their birthday segments of their radio programs. Musically, the birthday party continued the energy of freedom and the signature kazoos that were used on freedom. Birthday party was a nice follow-up to freedom, but it lacked that energy that freedom had and therefore did not get as strong of a response from their fan base as freedom. But it was a fun song in the tradition of those early 80s fun rap songs. Some of the vocals would also play a pivotal part in a single that Grandmaster Flash will be releasing soon. In fact, that single, 1981's The Adventures of Grandmaster Flash on the Wheels of Steel, was perhaps the most important single released on Sugar Hill Records. It was one of the most important rap singles ever released, and certainly one of the most important and influential songs in modern music. The Adventures on the Wheels of Steel was groundbreaking and a roller coaster ride on several levels. This was the first time the actual New York DJ street culture had been put onto a record and released for mass consumption. Containing scratched and mixed snippets of Another One Bites the Dust by Queen, Rapture by Blondie, The Eighth Wonder by the Sugar Hill Gang, The Birthday Party by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Good Times by Sheik, Monster Jam by Spoonie G in the sequence, and some other more obscure records. This record had to be the most obscure one released in the 80s decade. Many of those who were fortunate enough to witness the embryonic stages of hip hop in the Bronx and other parts of New York had seen and heard scratching before. But outside of the tri-states, that was something that was totally unheard of. Upon hearing the record myself, I was blown away by it. But more than anything, I wanted to know, how is he doing that? How does he make the sounds repeat? What's the scratching noise? Now that might sound bizarre today after seeing and hearing scratching for the last 30 years, but when it's something you've never heard or witnessed before and you're 11 years old, it's enough to blow your mind. Flash said that he had been asking Sylvia for a couple of years could he do a cut record, and she kept telling him, yeah, we can do it soon. They had just come off of tour, and he asked her again, and she said, yeah, let's go in the studio and do it. So Flash gathered the records that he wanted, and he said he was able to do it in three takes. Now, mind you, this is before Serato, computers, and electronic manipulation of tracks. This was Flash going into the studio with the records that he wanted to use, lining them up, timing them just right, and doing it in real time. Flash says that the first take was just to get familiar with moving from one turntable to the next, the dexterity of it. The second time was just to get even more familiar, and he nailed it on the third time. Sylvia flew Mel in with Flash to record the record. Flash says that even though the record was influential in America, it seemed to get much more attention overseas. He says that when they went to record it overseas, the crowd went nuts, but here it seemed like no one cared. He said the only one who supported it at radio was Frankie Crocker of WBLS in New York. Even though Flash knows that it was an influential record, he probably has no idea how many young lives that he changed with the release of that record. In 1981, The Genius of Love by the Tom Tom Club was all over the radios and dance floors of urban America. Sticking with the tradition of taking a popular record and converting it to a rap record, the rap group Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde had their own version 
called Genius of Rap on Profile Records. But Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five made a version called It's Nasty using that backing music from Genius of Love. If the birthday party lacked the energy of freedom, then It's Nasty definitely picked up where freedom left off. With the signature harmonizing and horn sections, It's Nasty was an incredible record in 1981. And it's also one of the earliest examples of a rap remix. There was a short version and long version, but they actually had different lyrics. It's Nasty would also see the further honing of the skills of passing the microphone back and forth between the five MCs in a cohesive manner. Also different for that time was the crowd response. Usually with crowd response, MCs would yell out, What's your zodiac sign? What's your name? On this one, Melly Mel wanted to know your favorite gene, and the crowd would come back with their favorite gene. Melly Mel also rhymed in French on the track. It may not sound like much today, but for that time, nobody was doing anything like that. Somewhere around 1981, Michael Johnson and Maurice Starr of Boston International Records, also of the Johnson crew, approached Sylvia Robinson to do some production work. In addition to doing tracks for one of her groups called Brother to Brother, they had their own original track called The Rapper Showdown. Both of these brothers were multi-instrumentalists, and between the two of them, they could compose their own complete tracks. They were actually rapping on The Rapper Showdown track, but Sylvia just wanted the instrumental. She struggled with giving it to the Sugar Hill Gang, then she went back to giving it to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, then she settled on having them both do the track and calling it Showdown, and making it almost like a battle or competition between the two groups. Wonder Mike of the Sugar Hill Gang tells me that they were in the studio but not in the booth at the same time recording the song. He says he feels like they were almost ambushed because the energy they gave off was a more friendly energy just saying their rhymes, but that the Furious Five saw it as almost like a battle. If you go back and listen to the rhymes, the Furious Five were a little more aggressive on their rhymes than the Sugar Hill Gang was. But Showdown was an extremely successful song and an excellent idea by Sylvia Robinson to actually capitalize on the popularity and the fan bases of both groups. Some New York radio stations even had contests to have listeners call in and say which group they thought won the battle. Raheem tells me that he was always singing songs around the studio and in the presence of Sylvia. Sylvia heard him singing Flash to the Beat one day, and she decided that she wanted to re-release an official version on Sugar Hill Records. Is it real Flash? So in 1982, the Sugar Hill official version of Flash to the Beat was released. This version was of course a lot more polished than the unofficial bootleg release from years before. Where the bootleg release sounded like a bootleg was very gritty, and it was cleaned up and made official. Doug Wimish played an excellent bass line on it, and they added a bridge with more singing and harmonizing by the group. One of the interesting things about this version of the song is that it's a re-recording of a song where Flash was actually playing the beatbox for the entire length of the song. On this version, he was not allowed to do anything. Sylvia Robinson actually did the beat on the DMX drum machine. And for some odd reason, this version was not credited to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, but just Grandmaster Flash. This official version of Flash to the Beat just served to further solidify the versatile vocal talents of the Furious Five. As influential as Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five are as a group, that recording would be the last time that we really heard the group together on a song as the original group. 
Sometime in the early 80s, there had been a track floating around Sugar Hill Records that was done by percussionist Ed Fletcher, a.k.a. Duke Booty, who was part of the Sugar Hill house band. Duke Booty had ideas for two songs that he wanted to cut. One was called Dumb Love, and the other one was called The Message. These were songs that he actually wanted to do. Sylvia didn't much like Dumb Love, but she took a liking to The Message. But the version of the message that she took a liking to was more like a last poet song. Had a lot of congas and percussion in the background with these socially conscious lyrics on top. Originally, Sylvia wanted the Sugar Hill Gang to do the message. They didn't like it. Nobody liked the message. At the time, everything was about partying and having a good time. The message was a dark song about the ills of street life. It was so unlike anything that had ever been done before in rap, just, just nobody could fathom even trying to record it. So Sylvia would cease to bring it up for a couple of weeks. Then she'd bring it up again. And she was relentless with it. Within this time of everybody trying to duck the track and get around performing it, Duke Booty had updated the track a bit. In fact, Doug Wimbish tells me that the band had been sitting around smoking weed and listening to Brian Eno's Life in the Bush of Ghosts. The weed in that album influenced them or motivated them to start doing this kind of trippy track, which actually became the music that we heard for the message. But still, no group wanted any parts of it. And Sylvia finally saw that image-wise, it couldn't be pulled off by the Sugar Hill Gang. It was much better suited for Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. The track originally just contained lyrics by Duke Booty. And finally, Melly Mel was the only member of the group to say that he would perform the song. So Mel actually said a few of the verses that Duke Booty had written, and Raheem said the remaining verses. At the end of the song, Raheem started saying Mel's verse from Super Rapping, A child is born with no state of mind. The child is born verse. Sylvia said it fit the song perfectly and was a perfect outro like to leave it in. But according to Raheem, there was some bad blood between him and Sylvia. First of all, at the time of the signing of the contracts, Raheem was the only member of the group who wasn't 18 yet. Raheem's mother hired a lawyer to look into the contract, and the lawyer advised against signing. According to Raheem, this really upset Sylvia. And Raheem ended up being the only member not to sign until he had turned 18 years old. Also, because Raheem had an Islamic name, Sylvia wanted him to wear a turban. He wore it for two or three shows, but didn't like it, and told her that he didn't want to wear it anymore. Sylvia continued to push him to wear it. He said he didn't want to, and finally he won over. Those two early occurrences caused some bad blood between Raheem and Sylvia Robinson. Now, either that bad blood or the fact that she liked Duke Booty's voice better caused her to erase Raheem's voice off the track and use Duke Booty's original voice. So the verses will alternate between Mel and Duke Booty. Then she got Mel to go in and do his Child is Born verse at the end of the song. The only part that the rest of the MCs played in the song was the arrest skit at the end. And Grandmaster Flash played no part in this song, not even influencing the musical selection as he did on other songs before. Sylvia, who was heavily into numerology and had predicted the success of the Sugar Hill Gang, heavily based on the fact that they were three people and three was a magic number, as it was for her with Ray Goodman and Brown, also known as The Moments, was very excited about the fact that the length of this song came out to 7 minutes and 11 seconds. She said that this was a good sign and it would be a smash hit. Now, whether you believe in numerology and the prophecies of Sylvia Robinson or not, History shows us that The Message was another smash record on the Sugar Hill label. There's no need for a lengthy discussion on the social and musical impacts of The Message, but in 2016, The Message has been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, as well as the Library of Congress archives, which includes recordings of Edison and other things of historical importance. It's also largely responsible for Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five being the first rap group inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as well as the dozens and dozens of accolades it's received since its release in 1982. If you are alive and old enough to remember the summer of 1982, every car driving by, every hour on the radio, the message was everywhere. It was the game changer in rap, and it created a template for MCs to talk about something other than themselves. It could be argued that there would be no Public Enemy, NWA, or any other social hip-hop group without the message. But on the other end of the spectrum, Grandmaster Flash says that that record was the beginning and the end. He said the price was too high to pay for that record. 
and every other member of the group agrees that that was the beginning of the end. In 1982, The Message 2, Survival, was released. Capitalizing off The Message and picking up where it left off, The Message 2 was actually originally written by Spoonie G. As a stipulation of him getting out of his contract, he had to write a song. Now, Melly Mel and Duke Booty rewrote a portion of it, but the original song was written by Spoonie G. Musically, The Message, with this track delivered by Reggie Griffin, a new producer at Sugar Hill Records who is a multi-instrumentalist and a one-time member of the group Manchild of Kenny Babyface Edmonds, was a little more up-tempo and upbeat than the original message. But it was lyrically just as timely. Just as The Message talked about things that were in the headlines, like pushing that girl in front of the train, things that actually happened in the news, The Message too even talked about the Tylenol scare. The lyrics this time around weren't as dark as the message, but they definitely were socially conscious. Once again, no other members of the Furious Five performed on this record, and it was actually credited to Melly Mel and Duke Booty as opposed to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. The Message 2 Survival was a huge success. It got play on daytime radio just as The Message did before it. The group even performed it on Soul Train. It was a perfect follow-up to The Message on several levels, and the music we would hear again very soon. Full-length LPs on the Sugar Hill label were more like compilations. They usually contained previously released songs with maybe one or two songs sprinkled in that were new. In 1982, The Message full-length LP was released. Raheem tells me that The Message LP would have been much more successful had it been ready to go eight weeks or so after The Message was released. But he said they did it backwards. They started on The Message album about a year after The Message had been released. It was very refreshing to see an actual picture cover of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five on an album. The only other time it had been done before was on The Greatest Rap Hits Volume 2 compilation. All of their other releases were contained in the blue Candy Stripe logo album cover that Sugar Hill was famous for releasing. So we got a chance to see the group in their true element along with Easy Mike, Grandmaster Flash's assistant. The only previously released songs on the Message LP were It's Nasty and The Message. The Message 2 was not featured. But continuing down the line of socially conscious songs was It's a Shame, which was a remake of It's a Shame by the Detroit Spinners. It also contained a musical interpolation of Pieces of a Dream's Mount Airy Groove, which was a popular record at the time. It's a Shame contained the harmonizing and rhyming that we had come to love the Furious Five for, and Grandmaster Flash got a chance to shine on the record as well. Yo Flash, this time cut it in mellow. Hey, teacher, what? Talk to me about what? Peace, there is no peace. Why? Who wants to know? We do. Cause men love money. Why? Greed. Why not share? Hell no. Why? Why not? Cause to share so that you care for it. The album also contains She's Fresh, which was actually musically based on sex by the Love Maniacs, which was a popular break in the street. She's Fresh was a chance for the Furious Five to showcase their harmonizing and singing abilities, and they did it surprisingly well. The album also contained two songs sung by Raheem. One was You Are and the other was Dreamin', which was co-written with Christopher Williams. Yeah. 
We'd like to send this one all the way out to Stevie Wonder. Yeah, Stevie. After all, he's the greatest. As I think of you, I hear precious moments crystal clear. Lying in Dreaming was dedicated to Stevie Wonder, and it was an excellent R&B song. Not the first R&B song that Raheem would have success with. 1982's Planet Rock by Africa Bambada and the Soul Sonic Force was a hell of a record. Sylvia Robinson wanted something that could compete with Planet Rock and knock it off its position in the charts. That attempt came in the form of Scorpio. Scorpio was produced by multi-instrumentalist Reggie Griffin and had that same musical track as Survival, The Message 2. Complete with vocoder lyrics, courtesy of Melly Mel, this was a complete electro record. The Show No Shame refrain that sung throughout is a motto that Scorpio adopted, hanging out with his good friend Rick James. The song Scorpio definitely took the group in a different direction and is one of the highlights of the Message album. Nineteen eighty three bought us New York, New York, which was actually credited to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. It will actually be the last record ever on Sugar Hill Records credited to that group. This again was a song that contained no input from Grandmaster Flash or the rest of the MCs in the group. Only Melly Mel and Duke Boot. Even though the song lyrically talks about New York, the content could really apply to any ghetto in the United States in nineteen eighty three. And once again, just like the message, the lyrics were dark. But there were some really incredible lyrics on the record. And it will also be the start of some incredible next level lyricism by Melly Mel. It would also be the last collaboration between Melly Mel and Duke Booty. I'm living in hell Just play ball or be an entertainer Cause niggas like me can't read too well Nobody loves me, nobody cares I dream about a life but I'm living in a nightmare Paranoid, skit, so setback, snowbound, bad news, psycho Heart attack, breakdown New York, New York had a very good video shot for it Very high quality, especially compared to some of the earlier Sugar Hill videos also, the hook for New York, New York may be familiar to many. 1983 also bought the anti-cocaine anthem, White Lines Don't Do It, which was oddly credited to Grandmaster and Melly Mel. According to Scorpio, this was an attempt by Sylvia to kind of fool the public into thinking that Flash was still in the picture. But by the time this song was released, Flash had already lawyered up and was about to exit Sugar Hill Records. White Lines was an incredible record, and Melly Mel says that the lyrics for the song actually came to him in a dream. It was musically based on a song called The Cavern by a group called Liquid Liquid, which was a popular breakbeat on the streets. White Lines was a huge hit in the United States and an even bigger hit in the UK. It's been covered by Duran Duran, and once again, no other members of the Furious Five participated in the song. Raheem did say that he sang on the hook and some of his vocals were actually left in the song. And again, you'll notice, just like with New York, New York and countless other songs, many MCs borrow little portions of white lines to make their own rhymes and songs. Strange reaction. 
White Lines really marked the beginnings of Melly Mel as a totally solo MC. He would do no more collaborations with Duke Booty for his next few songs, which would be lyrically considered next level and classic. I neglected to mention one thing. When speaking about the lyrical genius of Melly Mel, one can't forget. The verse at the very end of the 12 minute version of Super Rappin', the Child is Born verse. That would be the verse that would solidify Melly Mel as a lyrical giant in that era and eras to follow. But the significance of that verse is that it was said in 1979 and likely written before then, but truly immortalized two or three years later on 1982's The Message. This verse was written and recited before the influx of crack cocaine into American ghettos in the mid 80s. So when Mel talks about growing in the ghetto and living second rate and admiring the drug dealers and street culture, he was actually prophesizing on this verse and speaking on something that hadn't happened yet. But history shows us that it would happen and happened much like Melly Mel described it. According to the official bio of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Melly Mel was 19 when the message was released. This suggests that he could have been as young as 16 or 17 years old when this groundbreaking and genre changing verse was written. And that concludes part one of Foundation Lesson Number 12 on Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Stay tuned for part two as I explore Melly Mel and some of his solo classics like Beat Street Breakdown, World War III, Gangster Movies, and King of the Streets. I'll also explore his groundbreaking collaboration with Shaka Khan, making him the first MC to collaborate with the R&B artist. Part two will also chronicle the breakup of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five and the subsequent split into two factions, Melly Mel, Scorpio, Cowboy, and Easy Mike, picking up new members Dynamite, Tommy Gunn, Kamikaze, King Lou, and Clayton Savage. That faction will call themselves Grandmaster Melly Mel and the Furious Five. The other faction will be Grandmaster Flash, Raheem, and Creole, picking up LaVon, Mr. Broadway, and dancer Larry Love, and they simply went by the name Grandmaster Flash. I'll also cover the various solo releases by different members of both crews. Stay tuned. Get at me on social media at jayquanva, J-A-Y-Q-U-A-N-V-A, and visit my website, thefoundation.com. That's T-H-A foundation.com. Imitating the style, pioneered by 